This is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. Who wrote the Bible and how are we meant to experience it? A series of scholars and authors examine that question on this week's episode of Up Close. Michael Karasik is a Bible scholar and religious Jew who is editing a new series of commentators' Bibles for the Jewish Publication Society. But he's also someone who can see the different voices in the biblical text, and he speaks to those in his book, The Bible's Many Voices. Michael Satlow is a professor of religious studies at Brown University, and he examines how the Bible came together and what happened as it did. His book is How the Bible Became Holy. And finally, James Martin is a Jesuit Catholic priest and an editor at the Jesuit magazine America. When he decided to write a book about Jesus' life, he took a two-week journey to Israel to do so. What he finds and how he combines notions of truth, authenticity, and devotion is the subject of his book, Jesus, A Pilgrimage. But first, Here's my interview with Michael Karasik. What you do with the first half of the book is, is address what's broadly referred to as the documentary hypothesis. And this is the theory going back to, I believe, the 19th century of the different sources, that the idea that the Bible is made up of different source texts, uh, in addition to the idea that there are several books in the, that there are many books in the Bible, but that, for example, the five books of Moses aren't really by Moses, and the idea that uh, that many of the other books are by specific authors from specific periods and try to convey a specific message. Right. So I actually would like to not leave your viewers with the idea that this book is about the documentary hypothesis. It's not at all. There's a reason it's called The Bible's Many Voices. When you're a good reader, you can hear a writer's voice if he's a good enough writer. And when you read the Bible, you discover that there are different voices in it. So it's certainly true, the documentary hypothesis is based on the idea that you can distinguish different texts, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the answer of why the voices are different. And in fact, nowadays, uh, there are people who are questioning the documentary hypothesis in lots and lots of its details, but the voices are very distinct. What you do do is you take these voices and you identify them to some degree with the, with the sources that are broadly identified in, in the documentary hypothesis, and specifically the Deuteronomist and the priestly voice. What are these voices that we find? Well, one of the major distinctions that it's very hard to hear if you're not thinking about it, if you're not looking for this or listening for this in the voice. But once I show it to you, you see it immediately. I've had this happen with students over and over again. They'll read a text, and I point out to them what they said, and oh my gosh. And one of the things that I thought was interesting is that every so often uh, you suggest that there's kind of a Jewish way to view these different voices. At one point you suggest that Jewish scholars have a different opinion. Uh, than, than other scholars. In terms of the way different scholars understand the Bible, maybe it's a little bit unfortunate because my assumption is if you're doing scholarship, you should be able to present an argument and everyone would accept it. I mean, this is one of the points of teaching Bible in a university rather than in a yeshiva. In a yeshiva or in a Christian seminary either, I could, I could say, here's what it means according to our religion, but at a university, right, if a Buddhist shows up in the class, what are you talking about? I have to speak as if it's a historical and literary document. What I did say, and I'm not sure if this is where you were going with part of your question, is that the fact that I can hear these different voices doesn't necessarily rule out anyone's religious belief. And now, Michael Satlow on how the Bible became holy. When you read the Bible a certain way, with an eye, eye towards kind of what's being said about the Bible in the Bible, uh, and, and how it's being uh, received by the audiences, that uh, time and again, for literally hundreds of years, uh, you, had, uh, you had efforts to make it popular, and people weren't, had wanted little to do with it. Sure, and that is, in a way it's easy to see, because people, have a particular way of doing things, right? Most people at most times, especially in antiquity and in maybe some other, other than Western cultures, they do things in a particular way because their parents did them and their parents' parents did them and their village does them and their town does them and, and the like. And now imagine somebody comes along with a text and they say, hey, it says in the text you're doing things in the wrong way, right? So how do you react? For most Jews and Israelites before them, it would have been uh, what's right, the text, or how we've been doing things. 
And for most people, it's how they've been doing things. It's uh, interesting how at various points in your book, it feels like the experience of Jews, uh, I guess at this point, 2,500 years ago, 2,600 years ago, uh, feels a lot in your narrative like the experience we talk about of Jews of today, where there's this back and forth and people are, people are moving from place to place and some of the traditions stay and some of them go. And I think in some ways, um, you know, it's, it's a little different today because tradition, that kind of mimetic tradition, that was really important in antiquity. In a way, today, we, in, in our culture, we value novelty. Um, you know, we're not afraid to say we have personal authority and we can change things, and things do change and move a lot quicker today. Um, so in antiquity, they, they didn't so much. They were looked at, you know, very differently. But that same kind of tension, you know, between text and what we do, what somebody tells you to do because it's written here, and what you really do, that, that goes way back. We can never know the whole picture of what happened 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 500 years ago. And what survives is what we, what we get to learn about these old communities from. But that for today's Jewish community, if you, again, were to go by the texts and you were to go by the very obvious signs of, of Jewish ritual and practice, you'd get a very different view of the Jewish community than you and I would have just looking around. Right, and I think that that's one of the things I wanted to emphasize in the book, too, is this, um, there's complexity. There are different dynamics, there are real people. Sometimes we talk about texts as if they are actors on their own stage, or they're actors in history. Texts don't act, people act. People give them authority, they do things, they, they do things with them, they do things by them, all kinds of interactions with texts. Um, that's a complexity that we have today, and it's a complexity that I think we had, uh, you know, back in the, in the biblical period. And finally, James Martin on his pilgrimage to Israel. The book really does focus quite a lot on this uh, idea of Jesus as, as a man, which I guess you, in response to what you feel is, an, is a lack of focus in, in other books. Uh, and a lot of it is, w with this trip to Israel, is you're engaging kind of like the earthiness of someone in first century Galilee or first century uh, Palestine broadly. And, and what does it feel like to kind of try to send, your back to send yourself back to 2,000 years ago? Well, it's amazing. Uh, not only being there and, you know, putting yourself on the, the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and saying, boy, you know, it sure is hot, for example, just something simple like that, but also doing research, as I, I talk about in the book and try to bring out in the book, uh, of places like Nazareth. You know, Nazareth, where Jesus grew up for the first 30 years, um, you know, and spent more time there than he did in his public ministry, you know, kind of preaching and doing all those kinds of things. Uh, Nazareth was a very small town, 200 to 400 people, very poor, agrarian. Uh, so, you know, using archaeology, we can get a sense of what his life was like. You know, it's not all speculative. And then when you go to Nazareth, you see what the landscape is like, and you say, this is what he saw. So, you know, it's hard to understand what Jesus uh, was saying and doing uh, without understanding, you know, how he was living and the context of his time. So that's what I try to bring out in the book as well. There was one uh, site that you visited where I believe your, your reaction was you, you looked at this field and, 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 and saw and it was suggested to be X, Y, and Z. You pretty much shrugged your shoulders and said, could be. You never know. Uh, you know, there are places, uh, the, the Via Dolorosa, the, the, the way of the cross that, that goes through Jerusalem. Which is the famous march that Jesus took. On the way to the crucifixion. And I was surprised to find out that, uh, you know, there's different stations, like places he supposedly stopped. Uh, and the stations uh, don't look like they're very authentic because that devotion, in a sense, developed in Europe uh, and was kind of transplanted back to Jerusalem. There were eight stations in Jerusalem. There were 14 stations in, in Europe. And so when the European pilgrims came back to Jerusalem, they said, why are there not 14 stations like there are in you know, Rome or France? And so they kind of sort of put that into the, the tourist sites there. So, so there's a lot of stuff you have to take with a grain of salt. But as I said, there's a lot of stuff that's, you know, that's, this is it. This is, these are the walls of Jerusalem. Jesus would have seen this. Right. And it also suggests some things. Uh, obviously, being that Jesus grew up in the Jewish community, it's a, it provides a lot of uh, interface with the Jewish life uh, of that time. In particular, you were really shocked to find out, for example, that there was no synagogue in Nazareth mm -hmm. at the time, mm -hmm. a and and that Jewish life was probably different than you imagine you know, coming from here in the states. Well, yeah, and I think it's also uh, it's it's really important for Christians to understand his Jewishness. I always like when I preach to say. 
Jesus was a Jew, Mary was a Jew, Joseph was a Jew, his grandparents were Jews, the disciples were Jews, and you know, Christians are sometimes surprised, and I, I preached that once at a, at, a, at a mass, and someone said, well, but, but really they were Christians. And I said, no, they were Jews, you know? And to understand uh, him uh, in that Jewish context, uh, and to understand what was going on in Judaism at the time, uh, what it meant for him to read scripture, what it meant for him to be called a rabbi, you know, back then, you know, how, how that's different from what we understand today, you know, gives Christians an understanding of who he was. You cannot understand him outside of his Jewish context. That's all for this week's abbreviated web episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable, or listen to the full audio of the show as a podcast, available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under premium channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.